Welcome back to the next section or next segment on add-on instructions. This one is going to be on nesting, add-on instructions in an add-on instruction. <clears throat> as you know, you can nest add-on instructions inside of add-on instructions. As we mentioned earlier, you can nest seven levels deep. That is, add-on instructions inside of add-on instructions, inside of add-on instructions, up to seven levels deep. That does, doesn't just mean one thread seven levels deep. You can create an add-on instruction that has a half a dozen, a dozen add-on instructions, and each one of those have a half a dozen or a dozen add-on instructions and so forth. Uh, and it's just like subroutines. If you're familiar with subroutines, you could nest them many levels deep as well. The big difference between subroutines and add-on instructions is portability of add-on instructions and the secure nature of the private or local tags inside of add-on instructions. We are not going to go into more detail on subroutines versus add-on instructions in this presentation. We just wanted to mention it for those of you who were flashing back on subroutines and passing parameters in and out each time you called them. The add-on instruction that we just created was for cylinder diagnostics. So let's nest two of them into another add-on instruction created also for cylinders. Here we have, and I realize this is not a very good picture. Uh, it's the best I could find for multi-position cylinders. So it'll work. Here we have tandem cylinders, or sometimes affectionately referred to as piggyback. They are also referred to as multi-position cylinders. More often, multi-position than anything else. Some are three-position, and some configurations will actually provide a position, a unique position for each of the four states. Remember, you have two cylinders. Each one has an extend and a retract. In the upper example, the two cylinders share a common rod, but the cylinders are not physically connected. They would not both be bolted to a common plate, otherwise nothing would move. Whereas the lower example, the cylinders are one, but not the rod. Normally, something is going to be stationary in the upper example, one cylinder is bolted stationary while the other is mounted on a slide. In the lower example, the cylinders are one and either rod could be attached to something stationary while the cylinder moves in reaction to which port is under pressure. And the rod on the opposite end extends and retracts independently of each other. Here's another example. The rods are independent, and you have one cylinder. Now, if you try to visualize internally, the rear piston pushes the front piston and rod to a partial extension. So the cylinder in the rear, the one that doesn't show the rod sticking out of it, when you apply pressure on the far port, that pushes the piston forward. The rod on that piston pushes the piston in the next cylinder forward as well, but not all the way to the end of stroke. And then when you apply pressure to the third port there, uh, which would be the rear port on the second cylinder, the cylinder on the right, that then pushes the piston in the second cylinder away from the rod in the first and further extends the rod out. You can find more information on this on the web. Okay, here's a diagram of um, the one I just showed you. Now, if you look at the diagram up there, we'll call this position zero. So you see a piston and a rod, and the rod on the, the short rod pushes it against the back side of the piston that's connected to the longer rod. So, um, and that would be, would have been position zero. Here's position one. The spool is shifted, and notice that the piston is now moved in, in the, the cylinder on the left. The piston has been pushed to the right, and the rod has pushed the back of the piston of the other cylinder 
so it partially extends the rod out. Now the working end here is the long rod on the cylinder on the right. And then in position two, you would have applied air pressure to the back side of the second piston and pushed it further out. So this is a three position device. Okay, cylinder A is, in, in our case, we're going to use um, something slightly different than what you just saw. We're actually going to use the piston and rod in the cylinder on the left to push the whole cylinder component to the right. So the whole cylinder, everything is going to move to the right on a slide. <clears throat> and this will end up giving us four possible positions. So cylinder A is stationary and cylinder B is on a slide. And here we have kind of a combination. This provides four possible positions if the cylinders do not have the exact same stroke. If they do have the same stroke, adjustable hard stops can deliver four unique positions for the end of the rod of cylinder B. With both cylinders retracted, the device is in the most retracted position or position zero. With cylinder A extended and cylinder B retracted, the device is in position one. With cylinder A retracted and B extended, we're in position two. With cylinder A extended and cylinder B extended, the device is in position three. So you can see there's a slight difference between position one and two, and that's based on the difference in stroke of those two cylinders. But remember, you can use hard stops to give you a variety of positions as well, but no more than four. Let's examine each position more closely. Okay, I think you uh, get the idea of getting four positions from two cylinders with them being in tandem or uh, interconnected physically. So we're going to chase a rabbit for uh, several minutes because this is a perfect opportunity to point out something that you can take advantage of if you assign your I.O. locations in an organized manner. Now what we're going to go through next we're not going to use in the add-on instruction simply because the add-on instruction has to function independent of how you assign your, uh, how you organize your I.O. on your I.O. cards for uh, addressing memory locations. It is worth pointing out that the four cylinder switches, which you can see says prox, 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 prox going across the top there. And the, in position zero, you have on, off, on, off. It is worthwhile pointing out that the four cylinder switches could be four consecutive bits in memory, meaning that you assigned these four cylinder proximity switches with forethought as to how you could use them in logic. Having done so, you have the opportunity to use the value of these four consecutive bits to identify the position as well as faults. And you have four bits, and of course we work with 32-bit words in the Logix engine, 16-bit in the 500 family. But you can use a mask move or move with mask MVM instruction to strip out just these four bits and then use the integer value. And you can always use that with a multi-state indicator on your screens to put up a message as to the state of these two cylinders. In a later presentation, we will revisit this idea and develop the I.O. memory map and necessary logic, but not today. But we are going to talk about the bit pattern. I always draw my cylinders from left to right, and that is how we will consider the bit patterns of these four switches. When the code executes, it examines the bit and memory associated with the input location that the field wiring of each switch points towards. If the switch is on, it reads a 1. If the switch is off, it reads a 0. So just in looking at that one cylinder, 
you have two bits, and two bits give you uh, four possible combinations. So right now, if you were to convert that from binary to decimal, remember the first position, the least significant bit, is to the right, most significant to the left when looking at binary, binary uh, values in memory. So the first position, the least significant, is units, and the next one is two. So you have one, two, and no units. So the decimal equivalent of one zero is two. And there are th four possible combinations, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one, or zero, one, two, and three in decimal. If we add the sliding cylinders to switches, they have the exact same bit pattern as the first one because they're both retracted. So ordinarily you would treat these as a two-bit pattern for each cylinder, but we have two cylinders here working in tandem, so we're going to treat all four consecutive bits. Now that's assuming that you assigned your I.O. addressing scheme so you had four consecutive bits to work with. And of course we have the pattern 1010. Now if you look at that as a four bit binary value and convert it to a decimal, you're gonna come up with some, something different than two two. Okay, we'll, we'll get into that here in a second. So if we add the sliding cylinders to switches, we have four bits and 16 possible combinations, zero through 15. Or if you like, hexadecimal, we have zero through F. With these two additional bits, we have one zero, one zero for the pattern for position zero. So position one gave us one zero, one zero. Position two, zero, one, one, zero. Position, and so on. So we've got one zero, one zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. We have four different unique combination of bits for each of the positions. If you convert these to decimal, remember your binary notation starting at the right is ones, twos, fours, and eights. So you have a two and an eight, that's 10. You have a two and a four, that's six for position one. For position two, the third one down, you have a one and an eight, that's nine. And for the one on the bottom, you have a one and a four, that's decimal five. Now, <clears throat> you're probably thinking to yourself, well, there's four combinations out of the 16. What do you do with the other 12? Let's look at all of them. So in order, zero, 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 zero. Let's just look at that one a second. Now, remember, you're comparing this to two cylinders that have each have two switches, and you're assuming that in the resting state, one of those two switches are going to be made, and you'd be correct. What about when they're both extending or retracting? Well, then you have the first state there, 0, 0, 0, 0, because none of the switches are made, and we'll call that neither, neither. <laughs> and then the second one, uh, you could say that the cylinder A is neither and cylinder B is extended. It's at rest. And then the third choice there, which would be two, decimal two, we have neither retracted. For the next one, we have neither and both. Well, we all know that if both switches are energized on a cylinder and they're mounted at opposite end, something's wrong. So whenever we have both, we just automatically put that red and that's a fault condition. So if you had stripped out these four bits with a mask move or a move with mask, and you were monitoring them, if you get any of these combinations that have both in it, meaning both switches on one particular cylinder are made, or the last one, 15 there, which is 1111, both cylinders have both of their switches made. Well, we know it's almost impossible for that many proxies to fail or short simultaneously. 
but they could be misadjusted as well, come loose and become misadjusted. So if you walk your way down through these 16 possible combinations, four of them are in green. Those are the four positions that are legitimate at rest states for the cylinder. If we take this one step further past the four resting positions, and change the terminology a little bit. The first one, neither neither, uh, would be they're both in motion. In motion extended, in motion retracted, in motion both, and so on. Now, the ones in red, both, they are automatically a fault. But the ones in blue would, be, would occur naturally when the cylinders were in motion. So what would you add to an in motion state to determine if it was a problem or not? In other words, let's say the cylinder did extend or retract and neither sensor is made. It left one that was made and never made the one at the other end, either because it's um, the cable's been stepped on by an operator climbing on the machine and he pulled the cable out and broke the conductor or the machine is jammed, you name it. Well, you simply add a, a matter of time. So anytime you have an in-motion state, if you add a timer, if the timer times out, then you have a fault. So this is just a little sidetrack here <clears throat> to give you some ideas uh, for other applications. It really has nothing to do with the add-on instruction, but I thought I would throw it in there free. Okay, here we have our two cylinders and we have two add-on instructions that we created before. Now, if this were the old style, these would be branched around. Uh, however, with RS Logics 5000, this is an unconditional rung for both of these instructions. When looking at the rung, you have a visual match for the device. Unimportant, but a habit for me. I tend to lay them out the way they are physically laid out on the machine. These two instructions are strictly diagnostics for the cylinders and must be encapsulated with some logic. Okay, and so we need a little logic here. Somewhere there is some logic that selects one of the four positions. So we need logic to convert the requested position into combinations of extend and retract. So if you look here, uh, we have retract the base, retract the writer, extend base, extend writer. Those four outputs will be fed to the cylinders to extend and retract them. So we take our four possible combinations, and over there you see in the permissives you have to retract the base, it is retracted when we request position zero or position two. See, that's an or, logical or. If we're requesting position zero, or if we're requesting position two, then retract the base. But that alone won't do it for position zero and two. You drop down one rung. If we're request requesting position zero, then we retract the writer cylinder. If we are requesting position two, we also extend the writer. So you basically uh, take your four requests and then you encode into these four bits for retract and extend. So if we want, and I just went through this, if we want position zero, both retracted, then position zero request or request position zero, however you want to create your tag, is going to retract the base and retract the writer. However, if we want position one, we're going to retract the writer and extend the base.
if we want position 2, we're going to retract the base and extend the rider. And for position 3, we're going to extend both. Okay, here is our two add-on instructions that we previously created. And here is our position request. And if you look at those two add-on instructions, you'll see that extend and retract request for each of those is attached to either the base of the writer extend or retract. If you look down through there, you'll see uh, the retract base, extend base, retract writer, extend writer in the upper four rungs is or, or sh are parameters on those two diagnostic cylinder. Now remember we're going to encapsulate this into another instruction. Okay, so we also need be, we need some logic to indicate when they're in position. So base retracted and writer retracted would be position zero. So base retracted, writer retracted, that's feedback from the instructions. And then we use in position zero as a bit to tell the control logic that it's in position zero. And then of course we have uh, to combine the warnings. We, we, we have four warnings and four faults because we have four cylinders two pairs of two. So we're combining the retract warnings into one retract warning. We're combining both extend warnings for both the base and the rider into extend warning. That would be in the sixth rung there. In the seventh and eighth rung, we're combining the retract faults and the extend faults into one. Now, because we're treating these two cylinders as one component, so to speak, we can do this. When you actually go to troubleshoot, it will be obvious which one gave the warning or the fault. So, let's encapsulate that. This logic has been encapsulated into a single reusable instruction as seen here. Notice that for troubleshooting purposes, all of the relevant states are visible at the instance of the add-on instruction and you do not have to open it to determine what did or did not happen. I mean if you look closely there, uh, there's your request, position zero request, you remember that logic, and then we actually uh, alias in our real world I.O. for the four switches and then we have a fault reset and in this case it's a push button and then we have our in position 0, 1, 2, 3, which is data that's really coming out of the instruction. And then we actually have the outputs to control the four cylinders, retract base, retract writer, extend base, extend writer. Those are alias to actual output addresses. And of course, we externally have control logic that selects one of four positions. Remember, we encoded the four positions to extend and retract. Here's how we um, execute logic to pick one of those four positions. And remember from previous discussions, uh, many programmers like to have a separate file for all the outputs. So these aren't alias to actual I.O., but they do indirectly through the add-on instruction. But if you look at these first four rungs of logic, you have a manual and an auto mode uh, position request. Now we have over, overly simplified some of the logic to keep this presentation at a level that does not overwhelm those just learning RS Logic's 5000 add-on instructions. What is missing from this introductory presentation is how you actually build the instructions in RS Logic's 5000 
how you assign the tags for I.O. That presentation is currently on the production schedule and it should be added shortly. The complete PAC Learn Series, that's Programmable Automation Controller Learn Series, as opposed to the complete PLC Learn Series that we already have on the website. The complete PAC Learn se Series for the Logix engine is the highest priority currently on our schedule. This will be similar to the current complete PLC Learn Lab Projects Manual for RS Logix 500. Okay, this completes the presentation of the concepts of add-on instructions. So we're finished as far as explaining the concepts and showing you some code. However, we're going to add another video that actually is screen capture live online with RSLogix 5000 as we create the code and then create the instructions and put the instructions into practice. Always we thank you for your continued patronage and patience. It's a real pleasure uh, putting these on, making them available to everyone out there. Uh, they're, they're a lot of work and sometimes we get weary doing them, but then when we get feedback like we get from a lot of you who watch these videos, uh, it makes it a real pleasure when we get feedback from someone like an electrician who says that he'd been unemployed for six or seven months and thanks to the information he got off these videos he now has gotten a really good job and that makes all the difference in the world to us thank you very much